Okay, I'll just say hello. I'm Steph. Um, I'm a designer and technologist, um, and I um, I started out life in this city. I was born here, so it's quite uh, exciting to be back talking about the future in um, the place that I think in the world that's definitely the best place to start things. Um, so my talk is all about starting things and uh, my kind of journey and making making stuff in the world. Um, it's also quite amazing being in a room like this. If you look around, I was walking around in here before I started uh, step up on the stage, and this room is full of invention. And I realised that we're standing in a room. Uh, built by people at the time that thought that this was the future. This was futuristic. Uh, there's things about modern manufacturing techniques. There's things about canals. Um, it's quite fascinating to think that this was a view of the future at the point that it was built. And now here we are talking about the future ourselves. Um, so I'm a, I'm a hacker. Um, it's a term that's been kind of given to me and... Um, Something I've not really felt that comfortable with, but um, apparently that's what you call someone who's a bit like me. And I'm going to talk through uh, a bit of a personal journey, um, some of the things I've learned along the way, and tie it into that theme about ownership that is, um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a big issue that we're all going to be talking about um, in this session. Um, and I've called this talk um, Starting With a Hack. Um, a hacker is someone who is constantly kind of playing and tinkering and making things. And my particular medium is, um, uh, is the internet and its data and its software. Um, but there are lots of different ways of doing hacking. Um, and um, I think when you use the word hacker at a dinner table, then the people who you're sitting with kind of imagine you as being this kind of quite sinister figure behind a kind of green screen doing evil things with a bank or something. Uh, or uh, like we heard about, um, back in the 70s, we're trying to start nuclear wars. I'm not one of those. Um, the way that I think about um, making things with software and making things with design and technology um, is more like this book. Um, I dug this out of the, the attic uh, the other day. Um, and this is a book that I had as, when I was a child. Um, if you can't read it at the back, um, it's Make and Program Your Own Robots. And it's using Lego. Um, it's, it's using a very old and basic computer. But I did this stuff when I was a kid, and I really remember enjoying it. Um, and for me, that, that experience was all about just um, experimenting and playing. And in, in preparing for this talk, I realized that that was a time when I definitely felt complete ownership over my own learning, over my own process. Um, and it seems to me that over the last few years, the way that we make businesses, the way we make digital products, the way we go about our work, um, it, it, it seems to have been slightly taken away from us a bit. There are these assumed words and these assumed processes that we should all obey in order to make the ultimate successful unicorn-sized startup. And I wondered if we could go back to some of that, uh, that playfulness, that kind of child playing around with Lego. Um, and basically, that's what we've been doing for the last few years. Um, sounds nuts, but I do work in Shoreditch, so uh, bear with me. Um, I, I have a motto, and this is our family motto. Um, I have little kids. Um, if, if you're ever seeking some inspiration for being creative, uh, just have some children. It's really great. Um, and our motto is create something every day. And I've been kind of sticking to that for some time. Um, and that's definitely informed the way that I do things and the way that I um, would do my hacking. Um, and often that comes out in hack days. Um, I'm assuming a bunch of you are all familiar with the idea of a hack day, so I'm not going to go into what one of those is. Um, but I do enjoy that process of going and doing some collaboration with a stranger on a weekend, uh, doing a tiny little project that's very constrained by um, a day or two. And I've been fleshing that idea out over about seven years by doing a hack a month. Um, and I've, over that period, I've started businesses from some hacks. Um, I've thrown lots of them away. Most of them have died. Um, but it's a process that I've been kind of working on, and I thought I'd share some of it. Um, these are three ownership hacks that I've done. I thought they were quite relevant. Um, I did a, a hack day with Liz Burial Page, who's an artist, and um, this is a crypto quilt. Um, the idea is that we came up with a, uh, a way of representing encrypted data. So this is AES-256 encrypted um, uh, text in the form of several triangles in, in three different colors. And then we turned that into a quilt. Um, and then we spent the hack day doing a quilt, which is quite unusual when everyone else is doing robots and you know, doing some software. Um, and this, interestingly enough, is um, a very personal family secret that Liz has not revealed to anyone. And we encrypted it. So, sewed it into a will and then put the, uh, into the, the, the quilt and then put the password to the secret in her will. 
So when she dies, the family will then become the owners of the, of the secret. And I'm quite interested in this idea of encoding information into physical objects in your space. We've heard a bit about that with the Things Project. Um, I'm quite interested in uh, data physicalization. Um, it's not a business, it's a hack. And this is my data necklace, which is um, a physical encoding of your Twitter feed. Because you know, tweets are great, and they mean a lot to you, and you remember them, and they, you know, you, you, some, you, some, some tweets re mean so much to you that you wish you could uh, kind of print them on the wall, but well, now you can. Um, this is a wearable visualization of your Twitter feed, and on the sides of each of these beads is a particularly prominent tweet from a particular time period. Um, it's a 21st century locket. You know, long after Twitter's gone, this will exist, I hope. Um, and this is my wife's. I made it for her. Um, and then finally, a little other ownership hack is uh, uh, something I did for The Guardian, or against The Guardian perhaps, where if you, if you mistype the when you're typing theguardian.com, you'll get a little surprise. Um, if you, you might want to try this out at some point later on. Um, I introduce five random uh, typographical or spelling mistake errors into every page of the Guardian website, um, which is quite fun. And you can imagine they were, they were saying, well, we own that. We own the Guardian. And I think there's another argument to say, well, actually, we all own the Guardian as well, because we're the readers. What are we allowed to do? Um, so I enjoy these kind of things where you're playing around with things. Th th these aren't businesses. These aren't uh, things that you can say you make a living from. So how can you make a living from sketching with code in this way? Um, I enjoy this process. Wouldn't it be great to like, build a business where you're the maker, you're the hacker? Um, let's make a st studio where we gather all the cool makers and hackers we know and um, start something ourselves. So um, that inspiration is exactly what I've, I've done um, over the last couple of years because I've already done a startup. And this was a company I started um, a few years ago. Um, and it came from one of those tiny hacks. So I've shown you those little things I play with. And A-Frame is a video platform for people to make video content together. It's quite a big idea, you know, make it easier to make uh, TV programs. But it started from a little experiment, just putting some words on a timeline of a YouTube video. Um, and then suddenly, I don't know, a few years later, we had 50 staff, we'd raised lots of venture capital funding and gone to America and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I realized that the enjoyable part had kind of passed, so I left that company. And I realized that actually there's something about focusing on the bit that brings you joy in your work. And I really enjoyed those spare time little projects. So knowing that I was good at that and I was good at, the, um, at this stuff, I thought I'd try a, a kind of different approach to building things and start a startup studio. Um, and we kind of joke about this. Um, it's, you know, I heard you liked startups, so I started a startup to help startups. And basically, we built products um, with a kind of maker-first methodology. Uh, we got all, all the people that we knew who were similar to, uh, to me in that process. I, I teamed up with a couple of other guys. And somehow, we magicked up an environment where the process was important to us, where we, as the makers, had ownership over the, uh, our own production. So we weren't trying to go and you know, get our grand grandmothers to give us their life savings to start a business. We were going to hack. We were going to experiment and see what happened. Um, and we called it a startup studio because the output of that studio, we hoped, through trying lots of things, we'd make something that stuck. A bit like the way Twitter started. Twitter started with lots of people playing, um, and then eventually Twitter emerged. Um, and there's a lot of people who are kind of trying this now. It's quite an interesting model where it's very maker first. Um, and the whole principle of the studio, and it's important that we had a, a kind of core idea, was to give a leg up to others. It's a leg up to the little guy, um, a way of kind of seeing if we could kickstart something. So the process we, we went through uh, was to gather cool people in a room and then have an idea funnel. Um, and this wasn't, we weren't, uh, we weren't trying to pitch ideas to other people. We weren't um, selling our services by the hour. This was extremely risky. Uh, luckily, one of my co-founders had enough money to back us to basically work on what we wanted in a room together by ourselves without having to have clients, which is very luxurious. So we, we thought long and hard about what we would build, and we came up with this idea of a funnel. And over a period of a year, we tried out 50 tiny little experiments. Like, we, we, we'd talk, talk to each other about ideas that we'd had that lined up with our principle. And then we'd do little tiny code experiments. These weren't business plans. Um, and then from that, we, we did 12 prototypes where we built one of our ideas in a two-week period. And we'd call those hacks. 
So we'd start with an idea on a Monday, we'd sit down, design out what it would look like, talk to some people about it, and by Friday the next week, we'd hopefully have something on the internet. Um, and then we'd throw it into the world. We'd just see what people thought about it and see, what people, uh, see how people responded and if they liked it. Um, and so it was a period of amazing making for a year, and we, we really threw out loads of cool stuff, really interesting ideas. Um, we, we, I realized that I'd enjoyed blogging, and I made a mistake with my, my blog engine that I'd written and revealed my drafts accidentally. Um, and in revealing the titles of my drafts, I suddenly thought, well, why, why don't I get people to vote on which draft they want me to write, because I haven't got enough time. And that turned into an idea. Um, we went for loads of different ideas, but the, the, it was a kind of intense period of making that looks like chaos, looking back on it now. Um, and then came the axe. Um, the, the period of making kind of happened, and there were some people who I collaborated in the room with us today. And at a certain point, you have to decide whether one of these hacks is working, like, have people responded to it? And if they haven't, you have to be quite brutal and just go, right, well, that's the end of that then. Even if you love the idea, like that little blog engine I just talked about, about people voting about my ideas, we had, I don't know, a few thousand people using that. We couldn't see a way to make any money from it, so we just decided not to focus it anymore and focus elsewhere. And this is quite a brutal thing to learn, but it's also quite... Um, uh, it, it makes everything quite light because you're owning your process. You're completely owning the way that you want to relate your work to others. And by saying to people, these are just hacks, like, what do you think? It's, it's completely different to going and raising finance from your family and then making some kind of deep promise that you're going to follow through in a really, really controlled and focused way on an idea. And it's a completely different way of feeling about things. And so this felt actually quite um, easy in some ways. It was, more, it was difficult for me because all of my ideas got killed. No, I'm joking. But um, it was quite hard that, you know, to put down ideas that you love in favor of others. Um, but learning that process of coldly evaluating your own work and then stopping can really remove you from getting stuck into a promise and stuck into having to deliver on something you don't want to work on anymore. And I've been there. I, I've spent years working on things that I don't want to work on anymore just because everyone around me is telling me, yeah, it's going to be great one day. Um, and then you grow the winners. Um, I'm not going to pitch you the things we made, but out of that process, we had another year where we, we've made three businesses. So kind of 50 little hacks, 50 little tiny sketches, and then 12 more developed prototypes that people used, and then out pop three, three early stage businesses that are all interesting, and they all have teams and revenue, and it's a completely different way of doing startups. I know startups are kind of on the wane, the way people think about them, but these are, this is maker-led. This is like, we own these things. We don't have any investors. Like, we are the team, we made the products. If they live or die, it's up to us. And that's very different to how it is for a lot of startups I see, where there's a you know, board, there's investors, um, and the ownership kind of slightly dribbles away, and the direction of the company becomes more uh, about consensus and bringing uh, several parties along. So in all this, there's a few lessons um, about that. If you, if you wanted to follow this, a similar path, and I'd have advice for you if you wanted to talk to me about that. But the constraint of it all was really useful that we had, um, uh, we had such a small amount of time to work on these ideas, and that was quite deliberate. I quite like the fact that on a Casio keyboard, there's only a few sounds that you can make. We're kind of the equivalent of that with um, building digital products. Um, to go along with the theme of the ownership strand this afternoon, the only way that we are able to operate that fast by, you know, in a week, I was working concurrently on eight different products, writing code, and so were the other people around me. Um, the only way you can do that if you're sitting on the top of loads of services that have been designed to enable you to go quickly. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of um, negativity around about what um, these cloud services and cloud platforms are doing for us. I would not have been able to put out that kind of level of work in that period if I had to invent everything or if I had to buy a load of servers and put them in a room somewhere. And I really think there's a strong argument for the cloud being an enabler of creativity and personal creativity and maker-led creativity. And so there's something of a... Um, a nuanced line in, uh, that operate in the middle where I realize that there's problems with these things, but actually for me to live and for me to do what I do, I have to sit atop these, atop these things. Um, it's okay to quit. Uh, I think that you have to learn that um, 
if it's not working very within the time that you've set out for an idea, then just stop. Um, and a lot of people get tied up in startup land and they get burnt out. And I, I'm often telling people just to stop. Um, and it's not all fun. Um, it's very complicated doing three startups at once. Um, it's, it's, it, it causes you a lot of trouble on a personal level. Um, it's very difficult to have focus. Um, and if you're a venture capitalist listening to my talk, and I'm sure, if, I know, maybe, maybe there are some in the room, um, the, the, the mantra is focus, 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 just do one thing. And we're going against that by having a studio approach. So the question was, did it work? Did we manage to get there? Did, did having many different things and not focusing and be de being defocused, did that enable us? I'm not sure because we still haven't proven the things that have come out from that studio, but I don't know many little kind of maker studios that have managed to do that kind of process and then come out with three businesses that are working. So this, there must be something there, and there are others now in London who are trying something similar. There's uh, places around the country that are kind of starting. Um, in Germany, there's some very popular, <laughs> very big businesses. Um, but I want to end on um, something I think that everyone can focus on around this. You don't have to start a startup studio to behave in this way. Um, what I realized in the whole thing is that basically I'd encoded side projects as my core business. I love doing side projects, I love doing hacks. Side projects are where you completely own your own time, you own your own focus. Uh, it's, that's, that's where your passion, is le your passion is leaking out in the world. Um, and it's really important to focus on that, I think. I had a wonderful meeting with a, a, um, a, a VC this week, and he was, said, I, you know, how do I, I asked him, how do you choose how, who to invest in? And he said, I, I really pay attention to people who are passionate and have been working on stuff in their spare time. If it's leaking out in their spare time, then that means there's something there, and they'll be really, really good at following through. So I have a couple of things. I'm drawing monsters. Um, this is my current little thing. I, I have an Instagram account where I'm drawing these little monsters with my kids. I don't know what that's for. Um, and I think it's okay not to know what it's for yet. Just play and let it come out. Something might emerge. Maybe I'll make some t-shirts with monsters on. Um, I'm telling stories. And um, I'm, I understand that Matt is here, who uh, is all about stories. You don't know, but you inspired me to uh, tell stories to my children. And now we have this thing where I'm recording all of my bedtime stories with the kids. And um, they all go up onto a little website where they can listen to it again afterwards. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, maybe there's a little product there. I don't know. It's a side project. Um, so I really want to leave that message with you that you... Uh, in all of this, we've done a grand experiment around um, owning our own process and doing things in a very different way to others um, and trying to be experimental and to be, be maker-led. Um, the thing that's emerged is, the, is the, the main thrust of it all, though, is that you have to be passionate about what you do. And the, uh, of those three ideas that came out of that studio, the real reason each of them worked, the only reason they worked, is because they were owned by one person who cared about that idea and wanted to see it come out in the world. So um, passion is the conclusion from two years of makeshift, and that's 20 minutes to still down for you. So um, that's me. I'm Steph. I'd love to have a chat with you um, about any of this. If you want to catch me, I'll be outside. Um, good luck with your side projects. <laughs>